Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ferox and today we're going to talk about cat penises in a mature and dignified manner. So not that long ago, at work one morning, we were presented with a cat whose owner had described him as being sick all night because he was constipated and now in a very bad way. Now anyone who's been working in a vet clinic for any length of time will tell you the cats are nearly never constipated. It's usually something much, much worse. But because they've been going to the litter tray a lot, people assume it's constipation. This cat, when he arrived, was comatose. He looked dead. Except when you touched his abdomen and he would scream so loudly that he would then vomit. His heart rate was only 60, which is very scary for a cat because it should be around about 150, 180. But in a cat in that much pain, it should be something like 240. And he was cold to touch. His core body temperature was only about 32 degrees when it should have been more like 38. He had a urethral blockage and he was very ridiculously close to death, but he pulled through. So the story is complicated, but it has a happy ending. So what actually happens when we have a cat with a urethral blockage? Often just called blocked cats in the context of a vet clinic. Dogs can get this as well, by the way, but they're less likely to because the anatomy of a dog is generally much bigger. Well, the kidneys are actually working. They're trying very hard to filter out all the usual toxic products. It accumulates in the bladder, but it can't actually leave the body because you have a blockage somewhere in that tiny little penis. Blockages can be structural, which means there is physically a thing in there, which is usually a stone or a blood clot, or they can be functional, which means that there's a muscular spasm stopping anything from passing through. And to make it worse, a structural blockage can turn into a functional blockage when you have the muscle wall of that urethra become so irritated that it just spasms shut. This is particularly a problem because once you treat the structural obstruction, the catheter you use to treat it can result in a functional obstruction. And that's no fun for anybody. So from the cat's point of view, the urea often goes way, way up, which makes them feel really quite sick and it can have side effects on their gut. It's the phosphorus, once it hits about five or six, that can cause acute hemolytic anemia, which makes all the red blood cells pop and cause sudden death. But in this particular case of mine, it was the potassium that was sky high. And that will cause the heart rate to slow down. Now this cat had a heart rate of 60 instead of the 200 or so that it should have had for that degree of pain. And that's all because of the potassium slowing the heart rate. When he was blocked, his bladder felt sort of like an orange in his abdomen. And it was rock, rock hard. When he was admitted, because he couldn't wait, we actually did cystocentesis to draw out 100 mils of bloody urine from his bladder just to take some pressure off. And it was still very, very hard, but it bought us a little bit of time. Some people will say not to stick a needle into the bladder of these cats in case the whole thing just ruptures. But at this point, it's not actually gonna get any worse. And it is kind of hard to rupture a bladder just by poking it with a little needle. So long as the cat doesn't wiggle too much, and he did not because he was nearly comatose, and you're pulling out a large volume per stab because the bladder wall will then contract around where you stuck the needle through. And even if you do rupture the bladder, you can fix that in the next couple of days. That's not the life-threatening part. This is the life-threatening part, and you need to get that potassium to leave the body. Failing that, there's a couple of other things you can do in the meantime. 
So the cat needed to be anaesthetised to place a urinary catheter, which is a fiddly little job because a cat penis is tiny and you don't actually want to touch the penis while you're trying to thread a catheter through the tiny little hole because the penis is sensitive and you will cause a spasm which causes that functional obstruction. It's also blocked, so it's not easy in the first place and we're typically trying to flush saline through to dislodge anything that's caused the blockage or at least get it to open up basically upstream from the catheter so you can slide it in. Once you've got it in, you can get all of that urine out and the body starts to lower its potassium because it now has somewhere to go. We also used intravenous glucose to drop the potassium because it causes potassium to move intracellularly. Which at least gets it out of the bloodstream so the heart can work better and you can deal with the rest of the potassium over the next couple of days. Calcium will often drop, but that's compensatory as well. Some people will use intravenous calcium to correct the potassium to get the heart rate back up, but I did not because this owner, in this case, didn't have a whole lot of money and doing it the calcium way requires you to monitor your blood calcium levels more often, which gets expensive. So once the catheter is in and the urine started coming out, the potassium started to drop and the heart rate went from 60 actually to 40, which is terrifying in a cat. That's because all the pressure was off the bladder and the pain went away. So this cat's heart rate was only as high as 60, which was ridiculously low because of the pain. We gave a couple of boluses of intravenous glucose while we had him on sodium chloride intravenously. And over about 15 minutes, it then shot up to about 130, which is acceptable. The cat will live with a heart rate of 130. I prefer sodium chloride for my intravenous fluids just because that potassium is ridiculous, but you can get away with using any IV fluids that have a lower potassium than the cat's blood level, which when you have a potassium of around about eight is just about every sort of intravenous fluids you can get on the market. Now these cats will need to be on IV fluids for potentially a couple of days to fix that urea and the potassium and the phosphorus. And while you're fixing those, generally everything else will go back to normal, as long as you keep that urinary catheter in place. There's a couple of different styles of urinary catheter. I prefer a soft silicon one so that it doesn't irritate that highly sensitive penis. But there are firmer ones and there are foley's I usually use the ones that I have to stitch in because cats are stubborn and clever and they will pull them out and eat them if you give them half a chance. But while you have the fluids going in and the urine coming out, the cat will try and put itself back to normal. I mean, they mostly want to live. You also need it to start peeing on its own which means you have to correct whatever caused the blockage in the first place. Now, sometimes they're called idiopathic cystitis. Which means the bladder gets red and angry and inflamed and we don't actually know why. Idiopathic means we don't know what caused it. It might be viral, but it's increasingly looking like it's stress. We can also have crystals, and struvite is the most common one in cats. Struvite is made up of magnesium and phosphorus and ammonia, and it is more common when you have alkaline urine. So we use diets to try to correct this. Infections can do it, but I couldn't tell you if I've ever seen more than one infectious case in a male cat. 
Urinary tract infections are more common in girls because the anatomy is different. But in the boys, the infections are usually secondary to that catheter. Because when you have a catheter in, bacteria likes to crawl up it into the bladder. And we also need to correct any functional obstruction that's resulted in the blockage or secondary. Basically, when you have a very irritated urethra and bladder, the muscles get inflamed, they get damaged, and then the cat can't really pee. And if the cat can't pee, you're exactly back to stage one whenever you choose to take that catheter out. Sometimes we take it out too early and we have to put it back in. And you can do this several times until you get it right, depending on what's actually going wrong with the cat. So once you've got your fluids going in and your urine coming out, and this will take 24 hours or more, depending on how sick the cat was. And in this case, it was about a week before he could have his urinary catheter removed. We still want him to start peeing. We will often use a drug called Prazosin, which has different brand names. And it causes the muscle wall of that urethra to relax. Because that urethra has been very, very insulted throughout this entire event, it will often have spasmed shut. And once you take the catheter out, you have a functional obstruction again. These cats should always have pain relief. And that shouldn't be negotiable. You are probably aware that the penis is a very sensitive organ and it doesn't take to this sort of insult lightly. It will vary on a case-by-case -case basis what sort of pain relief is appropriate. Whether you bring out the big guns like methadone, or whether you're using a steroid or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. It absolutely depends on the individual cat, but also what's available. Some anti-inflammatory action is useful because everything's already inflamed, and that can take a couple of days to get it to settle down. Valium is often used in these cases, even though it's a little bit controversial. Occasionally, Valium will cause absolutely catastrophic liver failure in cats, but it usually takes a couple of weeks to do that. And just using it for three to five days to get the cat weeing again might save its life. Valium's cheap, it's easy, it causes urethral relaxation again, And it lowers stress. And since stress could have caused the whole catastrophe to start with, that's certainly a benefit. It also gets them eating, which is really useful in hospital, because if they had struvite crystals in particular, we will often use special diets to dissolve those crystals or stones or to stop them happening again and the Valium makes them eat them while they're in hospital. Cats are funny. Sometimes they just don't want a bar of whatever food that is. Sometimes they only want to eat at home, but we need them to eat to get better, especially if they're going to be in hospital for a week or so like this cat was. And we will also, in the extreme cases, use something like Bethanacol. which causes bladder contraction. It's basically a tablet that says you are going to urinate right now, but we will only use it in conjunction with the urethral relaxations so that it can open up on this side as it contracts on this side to push everything through. Now, the diets we use for urethral blockage in cats are often discussed quite a lot on the internet, which is very frustrating because we use these diets only when we have to, and we do it to stop the whole catastrophe from happening again. They're not 100%, but they are about as close as we can get. They will acidify urine. 
they often encourage increased drinking. Even the dry formulas. And they limit the solutes that go in to form struvite crystals, like magnesium, phosphorus, and ammonia. To limit those three solutes, they often have to be somewhat limited in their meat content, because meat is a really excellent source of magnesium and phosphorus and nitrogen. But we don't want it for these cats that nearly died. So if your vet has recommended a prescription diet to stop this sort of urethral blockage catastrophe, which will kill your cat within 48 hours if it's untreated, please talk to them before you consider changing it. Lots of people stop feeding the diet because it's a little bit on the expensive side. And then three to six months later, the whole catastrophe happens again. And believe me, nobody's thrilled when that happens. Not you, not the cat, not the vet. So what can we do to prevent this blocked cat catastrophe? Well, the obvious one is to have girl cats. Girls can get bladder crystals and they can get idiopathic cystitis, but they have different anatomy at the back end, so they tend not to block. Promoting a healthy weight is actually really helpful. But really, it's more about activity. Overweight cats are usually sedentary cats. But if you can promote activity, they're usually leaner and they play more. And that playing is good for their stress. Stress is probably the biggest factor in these urethral blockages. So even if you have a cat who's heavier than it should be, if it's very active and it plays a lot, it's less at risk than a cat that's overweight but just sits around all day. Now, the diets are really useful. And there is a trend for various non-prescription diets to start making claims about urinary acidity uh, or urinary health or bladder health. And there is probably a lot of merit to that, but they're not going to be quite as good as the prescription diets. So if you have a cat who's already had the problem, go with the diet that's been recommended because none of the non-prescription diets have a claim for dissolving stones and crystals which are already there. But seriously, play with your cat. Be active. It's good for their brain. It's good for their body. And you know, it's fun. That's why you have a cat. It's good for them, it's good for you, and it will hopefully prevent a massive vet bill and risking death in this frankly awful manner. Now, cats that are going to get a urethral blockage may be sick for quite a while before the emergency actually happens. Whether it's from crystals or from idiopathic cystitis, infections are actually very uncommon in the boy cats, just because of their anatomy. These cats will often do things like urinate in weird spots for potentially weeks or months before they have the urethral blockage. And people will say, oh yes, he urinates in the bath or the sink or on the bath mat or on clothes. And a lot of them will say, it's just because he's a spiteful, nasty little cat. And they're wrong. It's actually because he's either very, very stressed or is very, very sick. Cats don't urinate on things out of spite. They might bite you, but they don't go and pee on things. If they're peeing in abnormal places, it's either because something is wrong, perhaps you haven't cleaned the litter box in a month, or because they're sick. So go, excuse. So if you think this is happening, go get it checked out before you have a life-threatening catastrophe. Your cat will thank you, and your life will be a lot better for it. But my name is Dr. Ferox. This is Wonka, and this is Trashbag. And we will see you next time. <laughs>